So thank you for your participation in the survey in 2015 and for your continued engagement in helping our campus strive to become even more inclusive and welcoming. So today we're also going to present the recommendations of three action teams who have worked over the last semester really dedicatedly to understand the data, clarify the data with some, some members of our team as well as based on the climate data from 2015 and as, as well as what we have known from climate data from the previous four reports, issue recommendations on how we can continue to create a more inclusive and welcoming campus climate. And so I'll recognize those team members in just a bit, but I wanna start by thanking three people who um, none of this, and I probably not ever sleep if they weren't a member of our team and have led this uh, essential initiative forward over the last two years, and who join me and the entire campus community, um, and will join me in the entire campus community in partnering to ensure that the data and the reports that we have released to the campus are really truly living documents, that they become action-oriented documents that don't just sit on the shelves and that inform our decisions and efforts to uh, improve our campus climate. And so um, without saying too much thanks to them, I do want to recognize Dr. Kathleen Vanderveen, Andrew Plague, and Hector Rodriguez for their dedication and hard work in sifting through the da data, working with our action teams, and really getting us to this point and I'm sorry, but we're not done, so we still have three more years of this, but thank you all very, very much. So, you know, I would, I would probably be fired if I did not say that this aligns really directly with our 2015-2021 strategic plan and a specific outcome to become more equitable and inclusive in all areas of campus life. Um, this is the strategic plan, which you all know has been released um, to the campus community and has embedded throughout it equity and inclusion within all of our units and all of the work that we do. Um, so I'll also ask Kathleen and Hector and Andrew to chime in on any questions that folks may have as they have uh, really dug deeply into the data and understand the process from the beginning to the end. I believe Kathleen and I have been working on this for about two years now from the planning stages and we'll continue to work on this closely. This is the plan for the time that we have together. We're going to review the process and what got us to today. Um, we're going to briefly summarize once again just because um, not everyone um, participated in the previous campus climate survey or has partic per participated in surveys like this previously. So really briefly overview our framework for how we understand and measure climate here at GVSU. We'll present a really just the surface of the expanded findings that are more fully expanded online. Um, we'll highlight the recommendations from the faculty, staff, and student action teams, and then discuss next steps and answering any questions you might have. Um, so with that, let's begin with sort of the timeline. As you can see, we've been working on this even prior to September 2015, when Kathleen and I started working on work plans to design a project that would be released later that, later that year. And we quickly convened an advisory committee um, and are there any members of that advisory committee in the room? I know Kathleen's here, Marlene's here, Rhonda's here. Thank you for your work in helping us uh, refine an instrument that was shorter, which I'm sh sure the campus appreciated, but really got to questions that allowed us to understand what actions we should take as a university to improve campus climate. Of course, the survey was administered for two weeks in November of 2015. Um, we used an outside data analyst who conducted the initial high-level analyses, which were released um, or shortly after that um, in open campus forums as well as online. That video and that report is still on our website. Soon after, we convened three action teams, as I mentioned, and they were all volunteers, and so I really appreciate the time that you've given to, to helping us understand this data and also the recommendations that you had put forward to us just last week. Um, I'll stipulate that the recommendations and the reports that have been submitted uh, this year, which are now posted online, the action teams were given very confined guidelines in how to, um, how to present recommendations. Um, in 2011, we had 154 recommendations that were submitted to the university. Um, we have provided updates on progress for those recommendations online. That's also available for your view. Um, I'm really proud that we've acted on most of the recommendations. There are several that have not been acted on. There are several that are in progress, and all of those updates are now posted on our website as well. Um, the, the, 
the specifics that were, uh, the criteria or the guidelines that were given to the action teams and what you'll see when we present the recommendations are to really identify one or two annual goals based on the data for students, faculty, and staff. We asked them to do this over a five-year period and then to prioritize those recommendations. With limited resources, prioritizing was really an important key step. And then really identifying the one or two key recommendations that we can move forward as a university was also essential in that process. So that brings us to today's presentation. And I'll start just briefly by, you've all seen this slide a million times, I know I talk about it a lot, but in how we understand campus climate. Um, we are a campus that has been invested in understanding our climate since our earliest, what we called the Women's Climate Study in 1993. I know many of you probably participated in that if you were here at that time. And for a campus as young as ours, we have now conducted five university-wide climate assessments and numerous others within units and departments and divisions, and some that are on special topics, such as our, our ongoing um, survey of climate for sexual violence, which has been an important addition to the climate da data that we receive as a university. And we have used that data to continually act. So I really do encourage you again to check out the website on some of the uh, initiatives and programs that have been informed by climate data that we have collected over the last, um, over, since 1993 and even before that, as well as since the 2011 survey. For the 2011 and 2015 assessments, we used the climate definition that you see presented on the slide, and for those of you following online, we are now on slide four. Um, we also measured this in four key factor areas, experiences. So for example, I'm, am I experiencing bias or hostile behaviors on campus, and at the extreme, have I experienced a hate crime on campus? Um, we also measure this by perceptions, so for my own identity groups as well as those of others, do we believe that a campus is safe for the LGBT community, for example? It's also measured by perception, so perceptions are equally important as we understand climate of our institution, but perceptions of institutional efforts to advance diversity and inclusion are also key. So the visibility of leadership, the prevalence of training, reward structures and mentorships are also a key component of how we measure climate. And then finally, as you all know who took the survey, the assessment included an extensive number of demographic questions. And this is important for a number of reasons. One, we know that campus climate Climate is influenced by structural diversity, so the people and makeup of our community influences campus climate and vice versa. Um, structural diversity, so the people that we have on our campus influence campus, uh, in, influences climate as well. And it's also important because it allows us to identify and better understand disparities between identity groups within these factors, and in particular with a focus on our underrepresented and marginalized communities. So you, you'll see lots of uh, uh, demographic data and we'll share more of those breakouts with you today. Um, a be brief review of the population sample and I'll quickly remind you of this representation in the sample. So the data is skewed based on the people who responded and this is why this is sort of setting the stage for the general or aggregated data that I'll present in just a few seconds. Generally the sample population I'll say was on par a representative of our community. So for example, the population that we know of racial and ethnic minorities responded to the survey at a similar rate of their population within our community. Same for first generation status, same for constituency groups. So students, of course, responded at higher rates than faculty and staff. There was one exception when it came to gender women responded at higher rates in their participation uh, or than their representation on our campus. So just understanding that that may skew some of the aggregated data I think is an important uh, consideration. Um, this is how you responded as faculty, students, and staff. As you'll know, we were really proud to have the highest response rate that we've ever had at 42%, and that was really due to the great communication and outreach effort of Andrew and Kathleen and reaching out to many members of our community and also to our housing staff who really worked uh, dedicatedly, you know Andy and Colleen, to convince your residents that this was an important survey to participate in. So we were proud to have a high student participation of 70, so the population is represented by, by this slide here, 77% of the sample were undergraduate students, 12% graduate students, 6% faculty, and 5% staff. Again, consistent with our representation in the population. 
I'm really not going to spend much time on slide seven, but this was the population sample based on the divisions, both faculty, uh, uh, this is staff and faculty, so the divisions, uh, the administrative divisions for staff, as well as the faculty colleges. Um, as you can see here, um, this is pretty representative, representative of the population, um, but what is of note is that the responses or the information that we are sharing with you today will be skewed by the high participation of both academic and student affairs units, as well as the College of uh, Liberal Arts and Sciences, who are also the largest units at our campus. I did not share the response rates by division again this year, but I'll just remind you that the Division of Inclusion and Equity had a 100% response rate, and so um, just, just always have to plug that one. So some of the uh, sample demographics, um, and I'm only going to show four of those here. Again, I told you that race and ethnicity was representative of the population. Um, here you see the breakdown of the sample. Um, you, you also see gender identity, which was a new question that we asked in the 2015 survey. A note here, is, again, is that women respond, 67% of the sample were women on our campus, where 59% of our campus population actually identify as women. Um, of note here is that 1% of our population identified as transgender, gender nonconforming, or gender nonbinary. Um, we do not collect that information in a population sense, but it's just something to note that, um, um, that, that also is part of the data that we'll share. What was really um, great about having that question added and the response that we received with, for that question is that for the first time, we're actually able to conduct additional analysis on indicators that we previously were not, um, mostly because the sample size was either too small or we didn't ask the question. So this is going to be a really important thing for us to note as we look at some of the disparities in experiences and perceptions. Um, we also asked about disability status. Uh, there was a not notably higher percentage of the population than we expected who indicated they had at least one disability that interfered with their ability to l learn or work on campus. Um, of that, uh, of that percentage, 43% of those indicated that they had a psychological disability. So separate from gender identity, we asked about sexual orientation. Here you see on slide 10 that 8% of our community identifies as gay, bisexual, lesbian, queer, or asexual. Um, and 63% identified as Christian on the right. For the minority religious groups, 3% identified as non-Christian religion, and the four largest minority religious groups on our campus are Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim, and Hindu, and these are all of the largest minority populations, all at less than 1%. Okay, so let's get to some of the, the new data. So we began by this first sort of uh, factor of measuring climate perceptions. Um, and really, again, this is how do we perceive the climate for ourselves, our own groups, as well as how do we perceive the climate for others and other identity groups. So what we will note throughout this presentation are key disparities. And there were six groups that stood out as having the largest disparities in either less positive or more negative perceptions or experiences on our campus. There were other groups that did demonstrate some of these disparities, but these were the six groups that had the largest disparities when we compared them to the overall population. So the large number of demographics that we collect allowed us to do this kind of analysis. Um, here is really the heart of campus climate research. What are those disparities? How do we identify the opportunities to decrease those disparities? Um, of course, we can't always uncover if this is a statistically significant correlating factor. We don't know if climate is the reason that these disparities exist or that that identity population or their, the identity that they hold is the reason they're experiencing campus in, in certain ways. But noting these disparities, I think, drives us as an institution to seek deeper understanding. So we found these six groups that had the largest disparities in the experiences and perceptions of campus climate. Um, those listed here, and they're actually in ranked order. So the largest disparities are at the top on slide 12, um, were with those members of our community who identified as transgender or what we included in the survey, other gender com communities, so gender non-binary, followed by LGBTQ community members, people of color, communities with disabilities, and to a lesser extent, there was actually a larger gap between these last two populations, religious minorities and women, although the disparities there were higher than any other um, identity groups that we collected information on. 
overwhelmingly, and this is something that we should be proud of, overwhelmingly the campus uh, is, rates itself, or we rate our campus as very comfortable or comfortable as shown here in the dark blue. The lighter blue represents those who report feeling very uncomfortable or uncomfortable. Uh, this slide shows overall perception, the perception for employees in their staff unit or for faculty and students in the classroom, as well as for students who live in residence halls their um, overall uh, comfort level within the residence halls. Um, these numbers, I'll say, were similar to what we found in 2011, so the trend has remained steady from what we found in 2011. When we look at the overall climate, um, GVSU is more comfortable or identifies itself as very comfortable or more comfortable than the national average of, of, of 78%. Our overall um, uh, indicator rated us at uh, 87% in 2015. And we see the differences between some of those populations I previously mentioned. So less comfortable for transgender and gender nonconforming communities, uh, people of color and the LGBTQ, or LGBTQA populations. Uh, there were less or no disparities, at least within this indicator, with religious minorities and women. Um, and in fact, although I identified people with disabilities as demonstrating disparities, and you'll see in some places they do, and for this question in particular, there was actually um, individuals with disabilities were actually indicated that they were more comfortable on campus than the general population by a slight mar margin. So this slide um, provides several scaled questions that we asked to gauge perceptions of the climate. And this was both to gauge perceptions of the climate for our own communities as well as the climate for other communities. And so zero is highly negative, and that's towards the bottom of the screen on slide 15. And at the top of the screen, five is highly positive. Here we are presenting seven of those scaled questions and I'll note what the blue and red diamonds mean. The blue diamond shows the average response of everybody who responded to the survey. The red diamond shows those responses for individuals who identify within that specific identity community. So for example, the third item um, over, accessibility for physical disabilities or not accessible for physical disabilities. The red is the score for those who indicated they had a physical disability. So those within the identity group consistently ranked the campus as more negative, and individuals not within the identity group perceived the campus as more positive for those populations. So that, that gap in perception is something that we as a campus continue to try to understand. The largest difference you'll note in perception is around the transgender or gender non-binary community, who also rated the campus as least positive overall on this scale. So the second factor that we look at are experiences. So how am I actually experiencing the campus or what am I observing at the campus? While overall campus climate was reported as comfortable or very comfortable, at, as I said, at 87% at Grand Valley, there was a slight increase from 11% in 2011 to 14% in 2015 of community members who personally experienced a negative or hostile incident within the past year that they believed impacted their ability to live, learn, or work on campus. Um, and we can also see the differences between students, faculty, and staff where students experience these negative uh, uh, climate um, co conduct less than faculty and staff, staff at the highest rate, much higher than the average uh, uh, of 14% for GBSU. And actually, the faculty and staff rates are much higher, or not much higher, but are higher than the national averages. And that's the one place where we are actually higher than the national average when we, look, when we disaggregate faculty and staff for that question. So slide 18 for those following online. Um, here we are looking at the same question, and we have broken this out by identity groups. Again, four identity groups who had the highest uh, disparities between the total population. Here we see that the trans community reported that 40% of the members of the trans community experienced a hostile or negative conduct directed towards them directly, 40% of our transgender community at GVSU followed by 20% of the LGBTQA community, 24% of those with at least one disability, and 21% of people of color experience, compared to 14% of the total population. Um, the next two largest percentages, although they were not as great of a disparity between the total um, campus response, were religious minorities who indicated that 17% of individuals within those communities experienced negative or a hostile conduct, and 15% of women indicated that they did so as well. Importantly, there were subsequent questions that asked individuals what they believed the conduct was 
the purpose of the conduct or what they believe the target of the conduct was. And in every single one of these cases, individuals believe that the source or the reason for the, the conduct was based on that identity. So transgender members of the community indicated the, the hostile conduct was based on their transgender identity and so on for all of these groups. Again, and unfortunate, these are similar trends that we found in 2011. Uh, another question that we asked about experiences, and this is really important as we think about retention for faculty, students, and staff, is whether or not people had considered leaving within the past year due to a climate issue. At GVSU, again, we rank well below the national average on all levels, um, and we did see a decrease, and this is a good thing, we saw a decrease from 2011, where there were 14% of the population who indicated that they were considering leaving GVSU, to 10% in 2015, and then we see the differences among students, faculty, and staff as well, with staff again having a higher rating of considering leaving than, than other populations. On slide 21, um, we broke, broke this out again by the identity groups, and this is again in, in ranked order based on disparities. We see that 25% of the transgender me members of our community had considered leaving GVSU, 18% of people of color, 17% of LGBTQA populations, 15% of those with disabilities. Um, the next two groups were, were women who 12% of our women on campus had indicated that they had considered leaving, and there was actually no difference in religious minorities who also indicated 10% of their population had considered leaving GVSU within the last year. What had become important and what we recognize in the campus climate action teams but for the faculty and staff were questions about hiring practices as well as promotion practices. This was similar to question or to, to, to recommendations that were raised in 2011. So we asked actually additional questions about hiring and promotion practices. And in particular, we asked individuals if they experienced or observed unfair or unjust hiring practices at GVSU. And we asked them to concentrate on the previous year. So this would have been the previous year, 2014 to 2015 academic year. Specifically, we asked three questions. One, had they observed unfair or unjust hiring practices specifically? Had they observed or experienced unfair or unjust practices related to disciplinary action? Or had they observed or experienced unfair or unjust practices related to promotion, tenure, or reclassification? Here we see the changes between 2011 and 2015, where in 2011, 20% of the population indicated that they had observed or experienced unfair hiring practices. We see a 9% increase in 2015, something that had become of concern to our faculty and staff action teams. Um, I'll note that this was erroneously reported in the initial findings, where we actually had the initial analysis saw a decrease after we ran additional analysis with Hector's brain over there, he found that we had missed a population and the increase in negative experiences or unfair or unjust experiences actually was noted in the ex expanded report. We see decreases in the other two areas. Although what I'll say here and what I'll say throughout all of the presentation is that decreases or increases, 1%, one person in any of these situations is one too many and I think that's something that we as a university really value and need to and will continue to maintain as a, as a philosophy and as a practice. So to break this down further, as we've seen in the other variations of this question, what we know is that the historical minority identity groups tended to report higher percentages of observing these unfair or unjust practices than other identity groups. So people of color, when we compared people of color to white community members, people of color had higher rates of observing or experiencing these, uh, these unfair practices. Um, when we compared women to men, women had more negative experiences. When we compared heterosexual or straight community members to the LGBTQA community, the LGBTQA community had experienced more unfair or unjust practices within this area. Um, also interesting is that staff reported observing at higher rates than faculty. Staff reported at 32% and faculty at 27%. On this slide, of the 29 respond percent of respondents indicating that they had observed these practices, the largest reason or what we identified as target for the observations or experiences was based on position. Here was specifically asked about whether you were an AP staff member, a PSS staff member, an assistant professor. So position at the university was the largest reason that people believed that they observed or experienced these practices, followed by gender or sex, race, ethnicity, and age. Staff attitudes, staff and faculty and student attitudes. 
Um, these were new additions to the survey this year, um, and this has a lot of information. The, the blue, uh, the lighter blue are faculty, the darker blue are staff, and the gray are students, and we only asked students two of these questions. So a majority of faculty, 54, 51%, either indicated that they strongly agreed or agreed that they were reluctant to bring up issues for fear that they would that it would impact their promotion or tenure. Staff indicated that they were um, reluctant at 56% to do the same for fear of dismissal or, or retaliation. A majority of faculty indicated that GBSU in general supported work-life balance at 83%. And a significant majority of, um, of oh, um, that was actually staff at, at, at 83%, and a majority of faculty also did so. A significant majority of faculty, 74%, and even more staff, 82%, indicated that they strongly agreed or agreed that they belonged at GVSU and that they could be their authentic selves at GVSU. Similar to faculty and staff on these last two bars, uh, a majority of students also felt that they belonged to GVSU at 80% um, and that they could be their authentic selves at GVSU at 81%. These were all increases from 2011, which is something that we can be proud of. One of the measures that we've been collecting since 1993, and we only show here the 2005 data, is does the community believe that we care about diversity? Is the institution committed to diversity? And this here is presenting the percentages of individuals who highly agreed or agreed that GVSU is committed to diversity, and you see increases among all populations, students, faculty, and staff, and the total community when we compare to 2005 data. And this marks uh, the 10 years of President Haas's commitment or, or entry into GVSU and his uh, dedication and, and providing of resources and leadership in this area as well. One of the new sections that we asked was about institutional actions to improve campus climate. What does the community believe we need to do differently or enhance to create a more equitable and more inclusive campus climate? Um, one of the questions that we asked was about diversity training and education. And the question was, should GVSU provide more diversity education or training, and who should that be provided to? So across faculty, students, and staff, a majority of respondents, 58%, indicated that we should provide more diversity education and training. The highest percentage of respondents thought that that training should be provided to students at 63%, followed by supervisors and department heads at 59%. And then you see hiring committees and tenure, uh, tenure committees at 59%, followed by faculty and staff. Um, interesting, and I found, I've always found this point really interesting, is that the lowest percentage of individuals believing that they need diversity or education training are ourselves. And so I don't need it, but everyone else does. So it's something to just consider um, as we think about some of these, um, some of the efforts and actions that we move forward. Um, we also asked about mentorship opportunities, and this rose as one of the um, important considerations for um, improving campus climate, particularly for individuals from underrepresented groups. Similar to diversity and education training, respondents believe that we should provide more effective mentorship opportunities at 59% at across all groups. Um, and similar again, the highest uh, percentage of individuals that the community believed should have more mentorship opportunities were students at 68%. Um, here is a difference. While individuals do not think that you, we need diversity training, we do want mentorship for ourselves. So that was the second highest um, percentage. As you, and then you see department heads and supervisors, faculty and staff um, on the right side of the screen. And so, you know, we note a lot uh, throughout our climate data, and some of the climate questions are skewed to uncover um, problem areas on our campus, and that's really important. But what I think is also really important is that we identified areas of strength that exist based on the climate data. And the identification of these areas of strength was done by an independent consultant, Dr. Gonzalez from, from uh, Sacramento State University, who identified based on the data areas of strength for GVSU. And what we can be proud of is that we are an overwhelmingly welcome, welcoming, inclusive, and healthy campus climate based on all of the data despite understanding that there, there are disparities for those six key identity groups that we've identified previously. On slide uh, 32, we see some of the areas of strength. We have high levels of comfort with the campus climate overall. Faculty, staff, and students feel that they belong at GVSU. We have positive attitudes among faculty and staff concerning our overall job experience and satisfaction. And we had little reports of personal, negative, hostile, uh, experiences or intimidating conduct. So 79%, while I presented that 
19% of our population actually had that experience. 79% did not have that experience. So these are areas of strength that I think we should also capitalize on as we move forward in thinking about uh, implementing recommendations and thinking about how we create a more inclusive campus climate. So I'd like to now turn to the recommendations because this is probably why most people are here. So we had a lot of people that, that helped us with these, uh, these uh, recommendations. And what I'll say is that the list of folks that I'm presenting on the screen, and we're on, now on slide 34, um, had mixed participation, like all committee work. And so some attended all meetings and some provided input via other ways. But we wanted to recognize everyone who volunteered in certain ways. And so the student action team was led by, and I see him here, Brandon Fitzgerald, who did an amazing job in helping us understand the student data and issuing the recommendations. So thank you, Brandon. The faculty action team was led by two faculty associates in the Division of Inclusion and Equity, Dana Monk and Donald, uh, or DJ Mitchell, I've never called him Donald before, that was awkward, who are not here, but if you're online, hi, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Monk. And then our staff action team was led by Brenda Michener and Sal, Sal Lopez, and really Brenda, I know Sal's not here, but thank you so much for your hard work and helping us identify the recommendations. So lots of folks had their eyes on the data for a very long time and asked Hector, I think, a number of clarifying questions and he was fantastic at providing some additional data. And what we shared with the, the action teams is that this is really just the beginning of the work that we understand through the work that you had done that there are lots of other questions that we need to dig deeper into with some of the data as well as some of the recommendations that you presented. And again, I'll say that um, we, we did reference um, past climate actions on our website. We limited some of the recommendations that we asked our action teams to focus on. Um, what I'll note is that when we looked at the 2011 study, while we had done and completed most of the recommendations, as one example, the student action report, and I'm gonna look at Marlene since she helped wrote, write it, had 40 recommendations. Brandon, thank you for cutting that down this year. Appreciate it. 40 recommendations, 27 of which are completed. 10 are in progress, and three have not been acted on. And three of those have not been acted on because one of them was the Student Bill of Rights, and I blame Student Senate for that, so not taking responsibility. Uh, one of them was on Change U, which no longer exists, and the third one was on providing weekend transportation to support religious service attendance, which is already being done by um, religious organizations within the community. Um, so there, are, there has been a lot of movement, which is why I want to preface the fact that your recommendations that you're presenting today, we will discuss as a community. I want your feedback today. We will discuss as a cabinet, and Eileen, I know you're going to help me have those conversations with our colleagues on cabinet. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to act on recommendations that are important to our community, just as we have done in the past. So a summary of recommendations, you have the full list broken down by students, faculty, and staff. Here we have organize them thematically and have, uh, when there were duplicates or similar recommendations, have, uh, have grouped those or aggregated those into, into one recommendation. So one of the key recommendations from both the faculty and staff group was the creation of an employee ombudsperson. Um, there were also recommendations for clarification and expansion of our family leave policies. Um, all of our reports, students, faculty, and staff, recommended that we enhance and also make mandatory diversity training opportunities. Um, one of the recommendations was for all employees, including search committees, unit heads, supervisors, and appointing officers. Um, there was also a recommendation by our student group in thinking about how we create training for, as a PWI, a predominantly white institution, how do we create training opportunities that raise white consciousness within the community, that allow us to have allies within building more equitable spaces for all of our, all of our um, community members. There were several recommendations from the staff and faculty group around salary and hiring processes. Some of the data here supported that. Um, specifically thinking about how we might conduct salary equity analysis or sal salary equity audit, specifically thinking about disparities in underrepresented communities, um, as well as clarifying hiring processes within the university, as well as promotion determinations. Um, fifth, we see a recommendation from students and staff that we need to continue to collect climate data and do it in different ways. Um, one, two very specific recommendations, one, one from the staff group was to collect climate questions on exit interviews, and we have progress in that area. And the other was to continue to collect qualitative information from students in particular on campus climate concerns. And we have plans in the works to, to try to do that as well, and I'll share some of the next steps. 
A few of the other recommendations that were submitted by students and faculty were population-specific initiatives. And so there was a recommendation to institute accessible parking in the Allendale campus by our faculty group. Our student group recommended that we enhance our support for campus interfaith resources, um, also enhance our support for victim advocacy and sexual assault education and awareness, as well as continue to build pipeline efforts for underrepresented communities through offices like Multicultural Affairs, the LGBT Resource Centers, and others. Again, we see from 2011, these were similar recommendations that we need to do continued work to enhance um, our efforts for the, uh, for our transgender community in particular around gender expression, gender identity. Um, two of the specific requests from the student uh, action team was to collect information on sexual orientation and gender identity. The specific recommendation was to do this on the admissions application and then to enact um, banner interface enhancements that allow for gender identity, sexual orientation uh, indicators to be included on banner as well as uh, preferred name options in banner. And again, we have progress in this area that a lot of you already know about, but the recommendation and the details in the recommendation are important as we move forward with some of those efforts. A diversity sensitive professional development program was recommended by staff and in particular we have a lot of professional development opportunities that cater to the general population but the creation of a program that really had a key cultural competency component that really attracted underrepresented populations both to be successful in their current positions but also to understand promotional opportunities and how to advance at the institution was a recommendation from the staff group and I'll let Brenda add to that if, if she'd like uh, when we get to the questions and answers. Um, students recommended that we require syllabus language for diversity statements on all of our faculty syllabi. Also recommended that we have diversity ambassadors or inclusion and equity ambassadors in each unit of our campus. This is in addition to the inclusion advocates who only serve on the hiring committees. And then to continue to conduct further analysis of our campus climate data. And this was recommended by both faculty and staff and to disaggregate reports and to provide unit level data. So some of the next steps will address some of these and then we'll open it up to questions and feedback and any additions that our chairs or members of these uh, action teams would like to add. Um, the next steps are to first provide our vice presidents and president with division wide reports and Hector is finishing those up and we plan to submit those to our um, president's cabinet next week. Um, so each division will receive a report of um, a, a condensed report of key indicators um, and it will compare the division to the entire university. And so how do we compare to the entire university? What we know is that climate is micro, climate is not macro. So experiences and perceptions happen in individual units. They happen in cubicles. They happen in my office mate next door. They happen in those spaces. And so disaggregating the data to the unit level is going to be really important in identifying both, 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 both challenges, but more importantly, strengths. How do we recognize units that are doing fantastically well with our transgender community and go over there and ask them, what is it that you're doing that is different that we can implement across the university? So that's really the key to some of this, this disaggregation. We're also going to continue to discuss the recommendations that the action teams presented. That discussion will begin today. There's also opportunities to provide feedback online. Uh, President's cabinet will be discussing it as well as other leaders across the university. We will certainly share those with Student Senate and Academic Senate and the AP Committee, Colleen, I'm hoping, um, as well as the PSS Professional Development Committee so that they can add um, their feedback on some of the recommendations and also help us prioritize those recommendations. Uh, we are going to continue to conduct special analysis reports at the request of individuals. Um, this could be on identity specific groups. Um, for example, we have an, a disability task force who would like some more information just on the disability community. And we're also um, going to conduct at the request of colleges, college, college level data um, where, where, it's, where it's possible, where the cell size or the response size is high enough. Um, and that is also open to units who have large units who would like to conduct analysis for their units as well. And then, we're going to promise to continue to update the campus as annoying as it might be on the progress of the action teams, the recommendations, as well as how we continue to use the data. That'll be done through our website, which is up here, as well as um, in some, some of our newsletters and maybe future forums that we might hold just to update you on some of the progress of the actions. Um, Andrew is looking at me because he probably wants me to remind you that the special request reports must be submitted online. There's a form online. You always know that you can email any of us uh, for follow-up or questions or anyone online. If you have questions, 
please submit them to us as well. Inclusion at gvsu.edu. Um, we'll track those questions also. So thank you all for being here.